Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. Matt Van Dyke, our old buddy Matt Van Dyke, rejoins us today from Ukraine. Matt, it's a pleasure, my dear friend. How are you? I'm doing okay. Nice to talk to you again. Okay, good. Well, I appreciate you calling us and appreciate appreciate you reaching out to us. We have um, two images of the war uh, here in the U.S. You're familiar with this. We have the Western media's interpretation of the war, which is very uh, pro-Ukraine, pro-Biden uh, administration, anti-Russia. And we at uh, Judging Freedom have a perception of the war through the eyes and ears of the sources of our various guests, which decidedly uh, paints the uh, other view that President Zelensky ought to have signed the peace agreement negotiated in uh, Turkey uh, with the Russians two years ago. and uh, But for the intercession of Prime Minister Boris Johnson and President Biden probably would have and would have saved a few hundred thousand lives. You're familiar with those two arguments. Tell us what's going on and what your perception of the war is today in February of 2024, almost to the day, two years after it began. Well, morale is, has gotten quite low among soldiers. Um, because of the turn in the war, the counteroffensive wasn't as effective as we wished it would be. And more importantly, the games being played in Congress that have delayed funding uh, have led to a shortage of uh, particularly artillery ammunition on the front line, which has led to the fall of Avdivka uh, and, and other struggles on the front that are just sapping morale, um, causing a lot of concern um, and a lot of confusion about how Ukraine's strongest ally is, is seemingly dithering on the provision of aid. Um, how, what does Ukraine need more, uh, 155 millimeter artillery shells or human beings to fight the Russians? They need both, but I would say the biggest challenge is human beings. Um, you know, the ammo, the ammo will come. The human beings are a lot more difficult to obtain. Uh, Ukraine has ramped up conscription efforts. Uh, people have to register, but, you know, it's hard to track people down. Um, so sometimes there's recruitment people at checkpoints. And if you're found at a checkpoint by police and you can't prove that you have an exemption or you're, or you're not eligible um, and that your name hasn't been called, you could end up being conscripted on the spot. So, you know, they're in desperate need of manpower. That's a big shortage. The morale issues playing into it, um, but you know it's it has to be done. How bad is the uh, is the morale? Are there are there desertions? Are there people running over to the other side? Are there soldiers throwing down their arms and uh, leaving? Is there friendly fire? I mean, how how bad is it? Because this picture of bad morale usually precedes the end of a regime. <clears throat> Uh, there's not friendly fire. There's not there's not many um, people running away from service. Uh, the issue is people trying to da dodge the draft, which we have the same problem in America during Vietnam. Uh, a big problem is that when you're on the front line, it's not only artillery now, but the Russians have called up to us with drones. So you're actually hunted by drones dropping grenades on you. Uh, I face this myself. Have uh, you been have you been hunted? By Russian drones? Yes, my, my team and I were trapped in a forest, hunted by drone after drone, hovering above us, looking for us, dropping grenades right on us. Um, it was it was unlike anything I've ever experienced in any of these wars I've been in. It changes the entire dynamic of the war. Right? And once you're in a trench, you can't even leave your dugout, really, to, to use the bathroom without fear of death from above. Now, you're, uh, you're an American... In Ukraine, why are the Russian drones hunting you? How, how do they even know about you? How do they know who you are, what you are, where you are? They weren't specifically hunting us because we were uh, Western volunteers. Uh, they were hunting us because we were, we're in Ukrainian uniforms or, or, or multicam, which Ukrainians also wear. They can't tell that we're American. They saw us. We're soldiers. We're hunted like anybody else. 
were any of your uh, colleagues uh, killed or injured by these drones? Yes, one was injured quite seriously uh, and had to leave Ukraine for medical treatment in Germany. Uh, and another suffered a shrapnel wound. Both of them were wounded by a grenade shrapnel. Dropped from no, the tell me about the drones. Uh, can you shoot them down? Do they have smart bombs? Or do the bombs aim for a heat-seeking target? Or is it just gravity that brings these grenades down? The drones that were hunting us are commercially available. Uh, DJI type, DJI Mavic type drones that have been fitted with a common hand grenade that it drops the grenade pins pulled. Um, you, you have a couple seconds before it hits the ground to move. Um, some of them have thermal vision so they can see you quite well. Some of them don't, um, which causes difficulty when you're trying to evade these things. You know, if you move, you're going to attract his attention, but if it has thermal, it's going to see you anyway. So you got to make decisions based on the behavior of the drone hovering above you. It's really, it's in a way, it's sort of a uh, ruined warfare, if you could say that. Even it's made the job of infantry exponentially more difficult. Uh, it's going to be very hard to advance in this situation unless drones are jammed. Uh, you can you can imagine how difficult it is to to be able to not be able to leave a dugout because you never know what's just going to drop from you that you never even see coming. It almost sounds like this is a suicide mission, like there is no out, not even a reasonable probability of victory or safety. Am I right? It's not a suicide mission, but, you know, death and warfare is always has an element of being random, uh, especially with, with indirect fire. But, you know, this, this is a whole other element that makes it all the more difficult and terrifying. And the best laid plans can very quickly go bad when you get spotted by one drone and two or three show up. And next thing you know, it's raining grenades. So it, it isn't impossible, um, but it definitely adds an element that, that is going to take some different tactics and some thinking. And, and this will be studied, I think, at West Point for a long time. How is the government of President Zelensky uh, viewed by the soldiers? Is the president popular? Is the government credible? The president's popular enough. The government's credible. Um, there was, you know, a little bit of uh, confusion and concern when Zeluzhny was replaced by Sierski. Um I think that, that Zelensky did Zeluzhny uh, a good favor by removing him before the fall of Abdivka, because it was obvious that Abdivka was going to fall, but Zelensky gave Zeluzhny the courtesy of being removed before that, so it didn't look like the, the firing was in response to that. Um, the Ukrainian soldiers I talked to had a concern about the change in leadership, but I think that some of those concerns uh, are fading now. I mean, the war was not exactly going well in just Luzhny, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, a lot of them I brought up on the on the show before. Uh, there should have been a counteroffensive started last winter, not waiting until summer, for example, when the Russians built up defenses. Uh, the force shouldn't have been split into multiple fronts. Uh, they should have followed the Pentagon's advice on this, but lessons learned to be applied in the future, I suppose. Uh, General Zeluzhny was very popular with the troops, and General Sierski, his replacement, has the nickname from his troops of the Butcher of Bakhmut. Why do his own troops refer to their boss as a butcher? Is he talk Are they talking about his butchering Russian troops or his butchering his own troops? I'm not an expert on Sierski. Uh, Zeluzhny and Sierski both have done great service to to this country and to the world, really. Uh, in Sierski's case, you know, some of that comes from his his tactics. Uh, some of them he's applied are Soviet style tactics using mass movements of infantry and uh, result in high casualties. Sometimes that needs to be done, though. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens, and we'll see. You know, I'm sure that Ukrainian leadership's listening a lot more carefully to what the Pentagon's telling them now after the failed counteroffensive. You don't if seem as uh, happy or energetic or enthusiastic or optimistic as you were in our prior interviews. I don't remember when we spoke last, but it, it wasn't this year. It was sometime in 2023. Are you optimistic for the uh, success of the Ukraine military as you have been in your previous appearances on this show, Matt Van Dyke? 
I always thought the war would take a couple of years. It looks like it's going to take longer. Uh, I'm optimistic for eventual victory. We have no chance, no, no, no choice here. I mean, Russia can't be trusted with any peace agreement. Russia will just rebuild and come back time and time again. Uh, really, the only hope is to push Russia out and lay enough landmines that they never try this again. You, you can't, you can't have a peace agreement with Russia. Furthermore, you, Putin's concern is that Ukraine will join NATO. NATO has a basically a policy that's not going to accept a country that's already at war. So if Putin can keep Ukraine at war, you know, Ukraine can't join NATO. So there's really, there's, there's no real peace solution possible here. Is there not a peace solution possible with the uh, Ukrainian neutrality uh, and not joining NATO? I mean, that's pretty much what Putin told Tucker Carlson in that uh, interview, or at least that's my read of that uh, interview. Putin would never accept Ukraine's word on that. I mean, it's uh, Ukraine can say we'll never join NATO, but who's to enforce it? It's very clear that Ukraine wants to join NATO. It's very clear that any country boarding Russia that's in Europe should be in NATO after what's happened here. Um, here's a clip of President, well, actually before uh, President Biden. What What is the uh, feeling about the American government, either from the Ukraine uh, government, the Ukraine people, or the Ukraine military, uh, that the next uh, tranche of um, artillery shells and equipment and cash does not appear to be coming. Uh, we believe it will come eventually. It's unfortunate that Congress has so much blood on its hands by delaying it. I mean, there's a direct link between the delay of aid and the fall of Avdivka and the casualties there. Um, you know, but I mean, America is a democracy, and this is part of why we're always fighting one hand behind our back in any of these conflicts, and Russia isn't, because Russia has, has a much better control of, of their people and their economy, being an authoritarian state. They can ramp up production. They can conscript people. They can. They don't have any dissent. They don't have any debate in, in government about this, whereas we do, and this is part of democracies. Um, the limitations we have in fighting wars, but fortunately, we have good, out, good uh, friends in Europe. Denmark just sent, uh, I believe, all of their artillery uh, to Ukraine. So, you know, there's people that will step up to fill these gaps. But really, it doesn't come fast enough. It's never come fast enough. America has slow played this, not not sure if they want, how far they want Ukraine to win, not sure what Russia's response would be. Uh, those games have also cost lives in addition to the decision to delay a counteroffensive. I understand your... Um views of a democracy versus what you call an authoritarian state. Um, so Ukraine is kidnapping people off the streets. You've already told us that. Ukraine has blocked people from leaving the country. Not exactly what I said, but. Are they, to, are they conscripting people off the streets? If people are, or if people are, are stopped at police checkpoint, and they don't have documentation that they that they're not dodging the draft. Then they'll be taken in for further investigation and possibly conscripted if they're draft dodgers. Okay. I mean, okay. I'm just I'm fairly, just fairly, of tick- fairly normal in, in societies that have drafts. I'm, I'm I'm ticking off the aspects of Ukraine that are decidedly not democratic. You can't leave the country. The presidential elections uh, have been uh, have been canceled. Um, we understand that there are uh, military brigades that uh, extol the virtues of Nazism. The Orthodox Christian Church has been banned. Ah, and you call Ukraine a democracy. That's the, each of those issues is worthy of an entire show. Um, there, there's the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is doing just fine. The Russian Orthodox Church here was a tool for spying for the Kremlin. That's, I mean, that's pretty well documented. Look, it's it's a nation at war. It's not a perfect nation at war, but it is a democracy. Um, you know, people are, it's a just difficult situation. I mean, what do you expect them to do? We, we had a draft in our country and we had similar challenges and similar uh, questions about limitations of democracy. When we had a draft. It's clearly obviously necessary. They're fighting for their lives here. They're fighting for the future of themselves and of Europe. You know, I mean, otherwise, come on, other foreign volunteers, come join me over here. Um, and we'll get you all signed up. If, if anybody has a problem with, with the draft, then step up and come over here and take the place of the Ukrainian. Here's uh, your favorite uh, president about a week ago uh, complaining 
that the Senate uh, of the United States has voted to authorize 61 billion in aid, uh, and the House, led by the, the Senate, led by the Democrats by one vote, uh, and the House, led by the Republicans, have gone on a two-week vacation. Anything you can do to get ammunition to the Ukrainians without a supplemental from Congress? No, but it's about time they step up, don't you think? Instead of going on a two-week vacation? Two weeks, they're walking away. Two weeks. What are they thinking? My God, this is bizarre. And it's just reinforcing all the concern and, and, and almost, I won't say panic, but real concern about the United States being a reliable ally. This is outrageous. How is it in the national security of the United States uh, that we should be sending billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine? Russia has been our, our main adversary for decades. Uh, it's a destabilizing force in the world, not just in Eastern Europe, but also in Asia, Africa, uh, the Middle East, everywhere. Uh, this is a fight that goes way beyond just Ukraine. It, it goes to everything that my grandfather and other people's grandfathers and great grandfathers fought for in World War II to establish a system where countries do not just invade other countries and take their land without a response from the international community. So if we want to live in a world where might makes right, then we can sit back and be isolationist. But if we want to be uh, following the footsteps of World War II veterans and all the way up into Ronald Reagan's policies towards Russia, um, and then honor all those legacy and all the sacrifices that were made um, for a better future for our country, then we need to support Ukraine. Congress taking a vacation, frankly, is disgusting. Uh, it's sociopathic even to not care about the lives that are lost. I don't know how any of them can look in the mirror uh, at themselves, knowing that because of their inaction, actual lives are being lost. And, and it's just, it's, it's pathetic. What happens if the aid never comes? What happens if this uh, vote on the Senate bill is never even brought to the uh, House floor? How much longer can the Ukrainian military last? I ask that not only because it's uh, profound, but because we're told that even if uh, the House were to come back this morning and and President Bi and vote on this, and President Biden were to sign the legislation this afternoon, it would still be months before any significant uh, equipment arrived. Like, we'll never surrender. Uh, as Omar Mukhtar said in Living History, we win or we die. And that's the situation here. The people thought even at the beginning of the war that if Ukraine fell, we turned to a guerrilla war. Um, you know, fortunately we have European allies that will step up and provide enough to keep us going. But, you know, we need America's help to win. Uh, we need Europe's help to at least sustain. Uh, with the delay in aid, there will be more casualties. There may be more more towns and cities lost, more territory lost. It'll just make it more difficult, more costly in money and human lives to win it back later. But we'll never stop fighting here. In your uh, interactions uh, with uh, Ukrainians, military and civilian, have you come across uh, these military groups that are neo-Nazi? I've never encountered even one of them. Is it a myth or do they actually exist? I don't think there's any units that identify as neo-Nazi. There may be individuals that have a tattoo here and there, uh, just like there are in the United States, unfortunately. Uh, in Ukraine, look, there's a complicated history here where Ukraine was a battlefield fought over between Nazis and, and Soviets, and most of their harsh memories are towards the Soviets because the Soviets won and, and oppressed them for so long. Um, you know, it's a, their, their, their history is, is complicated because they live through it in a way that, that others didn't, um, not, not to excuse it, but you know, some people are just ignorant and we'll get a tattoo that's, that's, uh, that, that none of us would like to see on them, but it's, there's no widespread, there's no units running around giving Nazi salutes as a unit. Uh, it's just a few idiotic individuals that unfortunately end up with their picture taken and, and used by Russian propaganda. Why is the Ukrainian military shelling areas that it claims are parts of Ukraine and killing civilians that it says are Ukrainians. Because Russia's on that territory and we're fighting a war. Um, the civilians are, unfortunately, civilians die in war. 
it's unfortunate it happens all the time if they're still in those areas um, when the shells fall they they know that the area it's not like it happens all of a sudden some people choose not to leave just like in america some people choose not to leave when there's a hurricane um you know it's 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 a tragic unfortunate consequence of war but it's certainly not intentional there's no reason to terrorize civilians for our side we're trying to win their hearts and minds right right well i mean what military uh, purpose is gained by ukraine attacking ukrainian civilians it says are ukrainians the russians says they're russians in areas of land that ukraine says is ukraine but russia says it's russia but but to distill this to a a, a question that's easier to answer what military purpose is served by shelling civilians they're not shelling civilians. They're shelling Russian positions that, and civilians get hit. Look, they're going to shell Ukrainian territory. Russia's on Ukrainian territory. The whole war is being fought in Ukrainian territory. They're not going to win the war just by launching drone strikes at Moscow. Um, this is going to happen. There's no intentional campaign of terror. Look, even if they wanted to, we don't have the shells to be wasting shells targeting civilians, first of all, now that the uh, funding has dropped. So even as a, as a practical point, it wouldn't even make any sense, much less a moral one. Uh, one of uh, the other Americans, aside from you, uh, who's gracious enough to come on the show, is a um, freelance journalist named Patrick Lancaster. Uh, and Patrick called us uh, a few days ago and came on and brought some rather uh, dramatic uh, uh, videos with him. So we'll play the it's Patrick one, Chris. We'll play this uh, video, which is the immediate aftermath of the shelling of a pizza parlor, a library, and a crosswalk in downtown Donbass. This is where the impact of the uh, uh, shell hit. And as we said, reportedly 155. Now, 155, that's only supplied by the West. These are not shells that Ukraine had before the Western support. These are the shells that come directly from Western uh, taxpayer money to fund the uh, killing of the civilians here in Donetsk. We're going to continue to show you everything we can here on the ground. Now, the military investigators uh, are here. We're going to talk to them, see what they have to say. Um, so we've got a lot more to come. Please uh, like, share, and subscribe so the world can see what's really happening here in Donetsk. Uh, here's a pizza place, Chilantano Pizza. Uh, and unfortunately, the crosswalk that these people lost their lives were in. Uh, please do all we can to show you this is a real situation. Please like, share, and subscribe. Patrick Lancaster, and right now we are back in the center of Donetsk. We had just come from a location where uh, Western supplied 155 millimeter artillery fired by Ukraine uh, killed two people and injured five. And just as I got to the computer to try to put some of that information out, uh, the, uh, at least one HIMARS uh, came down here on the library, the city library, not far from the city administration building, just around the corner, here in the very center. And we can see the huge crater here. Now this it appears to be, as I said, a United States supplied uh, HIMARS. The Russian investigators are here on this uh, site uh, with... Uh, uh, looking at shrapnel, and we're going to have a special full report. For Do you have any reason to doubt the authenticity of that? Patrick was in his apartment in Donbass when he heard these enormous explosions. He ran out with his uh, cameraman, uh, and the cameraman took those videos, and Patrick sent it to us. I have no idea, but that video we just shot, there's been 10 to 1, 100 to 1 of similar things that, that Russia showing out shellings that hit civilian areas, including civilian areas deliberately targeted. I have no reason to believe this area was deliberately targeted. Um, Ukraine does not have the ammunition to waste to be deliberately targeting. There'd be no purpose to it. Um, Ukraine, Ukraine has always, from the start of the war, been very careful not to play into any sort of Russian propaganda. I, I'm not going to go so far to say these are false flag operations. Maybe they are. Who knows? But um, really, in the context of what's going on in Ukraine and the number of pizza places, specifically even that have been hit by Russia, uh, this is really a, a complete non-issue.
to be reporting on. Not a non-issue that happened, but of course, um, this is a guy who I've never heard of this guy, this freelance journalist um, who's pitching, like his stuff, et cetera. Um, you know, it's- I'm really actually surprised you guys haven't run into each other. You're both Americans who just have different views uh, of this. Uh, We're not going to run into each other when he's hanging out on the Russian side with Russian investigators making fun, making friends with the enemy. We're, we're not going to cross paths. I don't think he'd be very well received in Kiev by anybody. The uh, high Mars that uh, he says were used to strike a pizza parlor, a library, a crosswalk and kill uh, civilians uh, are very accurate and have smart bombs. It's not like a grenade being dropped from a drone and gravity taking it down. So you aim at a specific target and it hits the target. We all know that. So question, do the, hang, on, hang, on, hang, on, hang on, I'm going to give you a chance to answer. Do the Ukrainian uh, soldiers know how to use this uh, equipment? Is the equipment defective or did they aim at their own civilians? I don't know about this incident, but I doubt that that, that guy, his professional diagnosis is that this was a HIMARS hit. I mean, he, he doesn't appear to have any credentials to be judging that. He showed no remnants of high Mars missiles. Um, I didn't see any in the video. Um, you know, you can, you can call in a UN panel and try to investigate this thing uh, independently, but there's probably numerous incidents like this on a, on a weekly basis, especially Russian stuff hitting the Ukrainian side. Um, have- high, high, high Mars ammunition and high Mars are very meticulously and carefully used uh, in this war. So if there was a high Mars strike anywhere in that area, it was probably to target a massing of Russian troops or one of their barracks or something and stuff, even the best, most advanced weaponry, sometimes a rocket or, or two goes astray. I mean, okay. if that was a high Mars strike, there'd be nothing left if they were targeting that as a high Mars strike. Here's uh, another clip of uh, Patrick Lancaster. And these are pieces of what is purportedly part of the uh, HIMARS rocket. Now we bring you this information from this intense attack here on the center of Donetsk because you deserve to see things from both sides of the line. Watch as much uh, sources as you can to make your own educated decisions because it's important not to be led by sh- like sheep by the Western mainstream media and the people that want to tell you what to believe. Find out the information for yourself. Watch as much information as you can. All right, just to give you a little bit of an understanding on what the situation uh, here is and how big this rocket is itself. This is one of the two craters of these United States supplied HIMARS hitting this library in the very center of Donetsk. Any reason to disbelieve that, Matt? Yes, first of all, it just looks like any random shrapnel you'd pick up from a site, but more importantly, uh, HIMARS are, are multiple launch rocket systems. They, they don't send just two rockets over. Uh, there would be extreme devastation over that whole area if it was a, a HIMARS strike. If there was a HIMARS rocket or two that went astray, maybe that's the situation, but it clearly wasn't intentional. There'd be nothing left. He wouldn't be saying one crater. There'd be numerous craters or just, just complete destruction. So there really doesn't seem to be a lot of credibility to what he's 